Please remain standing for the playing of the national anthem. Please be seated. Members of the Corps of Cadets, special guests and visitors, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. And welcome to the Virginia Military Institute and our 10th Annual Leadership and Ethics Conference. This conference is designed as one of the hallmark leadership events at VMI. The topics and guest speakers have been chosen to help stimulate our critical thinking and refine our ethical decision-making skills. And as we look back at the conference themes over the last decade, leadership topics such as grit and the American character, speaking truth to power, and leadership in times of global transition, we see that these are not simple issues or topics that fade away. This conference has become known for addressing difficult issues of ethical leadership development that are relevant and of national importance. The theme this year, disruption, challenging leadership at every turn, continues in this tradition. While the topic for the conference was chosen almost a year ago, it continues to be a prominent issue in our country today. Economic uncertainties and geopolitical issues that were of imminent importance when this conference was in the design phase continue to challenge the leaders of the world. And in many ways, disruption is not a new topic, but an ongoing issue that we face, that will face every leader as they make decisions. But what makes today different perhaps, and maybe even more challenging than a few years ago, is the speed at which disruption is taking place. Gone are the times when you wait for the daily news cycle or even your favorite internet site to report updates. And many of you are continually tethered to a stream of information. As leaders in this new environment, you'll be challenged to both respond to change and initiate change. These times may be viewed as a positive or a negative, or maybe both depending on the situation. Regardless, disruption will come, and we hope that this conference challenges you to consider this on a personal, local and societal level. To help us in our quest to face these questions, we have an excellent lineup of speakers, including our special guest this morning, General Joseph Votel. General Votel recently retired from the United States Army after spending almost 40 years in uniform on active duty. Most recently, as the commander of the United States Central Command, frequently referred to today as U.S. CENTCOM. He has certainly seen disruption in action during his long career. Upon graduation from the United States Military Academy, West Point, in 1980, he commissioned as an infantry officer and later served in Operation Just Cause in Panama as a member of the NATO Peace Implementation Force in Sarajevo and commanded an infantry battalion and a ranger battalion prior to attendance at the Army War College in 2001. Upon graduation, he commanded the 75th Ranger Regiment, which took him to Afghanistan in 2001 and Iraq in 2003. 
As a general officer, he served as deputy director of the Joint Improvised Defeat Organization, reporting to the Secretary of Defense. Served as, as the deputy commanding general for operations in the 82nd Airborne Division. As commander of the Joint Special Operations Command at Fort Bragg, and in 2014 was promoted to full journal with command of the United States Special Operations Command headquartered at Medill Air Force Base, Tampa, Florida. Two years later, in 2016, he literally moved across base at McDill and assumed command of U.S. Central Command. He has faced some of the most dynamic situations in some of the most volatile areas of the world in the past 20 years. And quoting from his testimony to Congress in February of this year as commander of U.S. CENTCOM, and I quote, there is no other region in the world as dynamic, hopeful, challenging, and dangerous as a CENTCOM area of responsibility made up of countries in the Middle East and Central and South Asia. It's an area of great contrast and contradiction, end quote. Today, he serves as an expert on Middle Eastern policy as a distinguished senior fellow at the Middle East Institute. He has lived through and dealt with many of the recent geopolitical changes, such as the pullout of the United States troops recently in Syria. You can read his articles on the United States foreign policies with Iraq, ISIS, and Afghanistan, and reference his recent writings on the ongoing conflict between the Kurds and Turkey. He grew up in Minnesota and has always kept close to ties to his home. And friends and colleagues that I have spoken to describe him as a humble man, a good listener, and certainly a team player. He enjoys sports and remains ded a dedicated fan of the Minnesota Vikings. And as a lifelong athlete, you will routinely find him out running with those in his community wherever his path may take him. He describes athletics as a fantastic laboratory for life. You deal with adversity, you learn teamwork and leadership skills. His experiences are vast and his perspective is certainly valuable in these times. It's an honor to have him as our guest at the Virginia Military Institute. Joe, we welcome you and look forward to hearing from you this morning. Ladies and gentlemen, General Votel. Well, thank you. It's, uh, it's wonderful to, uh, um, to be here. I'm, I am obviously not a graduate of, uh, of this institution, but I have certainly uh, seen the benefit of the product that, uh, that VMI has, has produced. Uh, I know many of you are familiar with uh, your assistant athletic director, Eric Hutchins, uh, who used to be the commandant here. I don't know if Eric is with us this morning. Um, he is, very good. Everything I've learned about uh, VMI came at the hands of, uh, of Eric uh, Hutchings. I'll let you determine if that's a good thing or a bad thing, uh, but, uh, but he certainly has been a good friend to us and he speaks very highly of this institution and represents you very, very well. I'm, I'm glad to be joined uh, by the superintendent and, and the other leadership here, and I'm especially glad to be joined by Cadet Nicholas Wainwright, class of 20. Uh, we were chatting beforehand. I asked him what these little stars represented on his uh, on his collar or on his uh, sleeve, and he explained to me this was for academic excellence and maintained a certain uh, certain uh, grade point average. And I, I mentioned that we had the same thing at West Point. I would just tell all of you that I was not a star man. Uh, for those of you that are C and C plus students out here, there's there's a future for you. Hang in there. All right. <laughs> I, I, have, I have a theory, and the theory is this, that the world is run by C students and linemen. Uh, so those of you that are in those areas, uh, hang tight. You're the, you're, the, uh, you're the pipe swingers of the world right here, getting things done, and there's a, there's a great future for you. Now, I, I also say that with a little bit of trepidation here. I certainly don't want to encourage anybody to pursue academic mediocrity. That's, uh, that's not the objective here. You do your very, very best in terms of it, but uh, there's a place for everybody has a role in what we're doing here today. I'm very glad to be here today to talk with you. Today's subject is leadership in a disruptive uh, environment. 
And, you know, I think leadership is tough in any circumstance. Getting people to do what they might be uninclined to do uh, requires a unique set of skills. And many of you are learning these skills right here at this leadership factory that we call the Virginia Military Institute. And it's always amazed me in the military that we often take our most inexperienced junior leaders and we put them in the most challenging leadership positions. Those of you that commission uh, upon your graduation will learn this the day you step in front of your platoon uh, and you'll learn that uh, now you are in charge and many of the people that you are leading are, have the same life experience as you do and are about the same age. Uh, but leadership is about learning. And you learn something all the time as you, as you continue to move forward in the military. As a, as a young lieutenant platoon leader, I learned how to listen. My squad leaders were all Vietnam veterans. They knew much more than I did, and I had to pay attention to them. As a company commander, I learned that uh, I had to set and enforce standards between different organizations. That which I valued as a platoon leader that made my platoon very unique uh, could actually be, uh, work against cohesion in a broader organization, and I had to figure that out. Um, later, as a field grade officer, I, I learned that you have to help people work within systems. Uh, training systems, sustainment systems, resourcing systems. As a battalion commander, I learned that it's important to create an environment for leadership to thrive. As a regimental commander, I learned that I had to bring disparate organizations together with different skills, different capabilities, and somehow bring them into a team, get them focused on a common objective. As an assistant division commander, my, div my division commander said, I want you to focus on battalion commanders. And what I learned about that experience was that you really have to figure out a way to help people think through their challenges without doing the work for them. Uh, and that was a great experience. As a joint task force commander, I learned uh, perhaps one of the most important lessons as a leader, and that is you have to trust the people below you uh, because they oftentimes know more than you do. Uh, we are an incredibly technical force. And as we were pursuing uh, targeting of terrorists and, and other uh, networks out there, it became very apparent to me that the people that worked for me knew much more about the technical aspects of this. And despite my very best efforts to understand this, I would never be their equal. And so it, it, it required me to trust them and create an environment for them to, uh, to succeed. And as a combatant commander at both SOCOM and CENTCOM, I learned the importance of empowering decision-making and risk management at the proper levels. So my point here is that leadership development is a continuous process. It isn't something that you start and finish here at VMI, but it is something that continues through your military career, or for those of you that go into the business world, will continue there. Uh, but, uh, but it will be something that, that will continue as you move forward. Doing leadership in, a, in this environment of disruption is even more challenging. And today, I want to use my experience of leading a 79-member coalition as a case study in how we dealt with an environment uh, that was principally characterized by complexity and disruption. I think you'll find it interesting. And it certainly fits into the conference that VMI is hosting right now. But for all of you, and I recognize most of you may not be participants in this uh, in this conference, I think it provides some good lessons and a good way of thinking about, about the future and about your future challenges. And my takeaway to all of you this morning is this. As leaders in the military, future leaders in the military or in business community or whatever walk of life that you end up in, you are going to encounter complexity and disruptive environments. Your success and the success of the organizations uh, that you are leading will depend on how you deal with that environment and continue to move forward towards the attainment of your objectives. And my observation is there, there is no silver bullets, there's no secret sauce, there's no shortcuts to doing this. This is about mastery of basic leadership skills. And uh, I'm hoping that you will kind of pull that out of it today. So I, let me begin here and uh, let me see if I got that, okay. Uh, I'm, I wanna start with telling you a little, little bit of a story here. And I wanna talk with a personal experience. I wanna take, take you back to December 19th, 2018. Uh, I was in my office at CENTCOM. I had finished a recent tour through the, through the region. I went every month, spent a couple weeks, and I was back in the headquarters. Of course, we're getting ready for the, the holidays at this particular time. Uh, the status of the fight here, we are continuing with our, with our campaign plan. Uh, we are consolidating our success in Iraq at this time. We are pursuing an increasingly 
challenging fight against ISIS uh, remnants that are in the uh, uh, easternmost part of Syria in the middle of Euphrates Valley. Every morning I started off with an intelligence brief and I followed that with a brief from my uh, web ops uh, representative, from my public affairs officer, and from my communications integration uh, person. And at the end of the uh, brief that morning, uh, my public affairs officer pointed this tweet out to me right here. Uh, certainly, uh, our, our president has a very unique way of communicating with the American people. Uh, that's probably why he was elected, uh, one of the reasons why he was elected. Uh, uh, but uh, this, is a, this is a feature of the environment. Uh, I noted this. We'd heard this before, and I didn't think all that much of this. So I was aware that this tweet had taken place at about 8.30 in the morning on this day. What I was unaware of is that a little bit later that morning, our president would have a call with the president of, of Turkey, uh, and that the president of Turkey would use this opportunity uh, to continue with his complaints about our relationship uh, with the Kurdish component of the Syrian Democratic Forces, our principal partner, a very successful partner, I would add, in Syria. Um, about uh, one, one o'clock, 1.30 one in the afternoon, I got a call from the chairman. Uh, Joe Dunford. Uh, General Dunford and I had a long relationship. We've worked together a number of times. So we have a very good relationship. We spoke every day, multiple times usually, uh, every day about things that were happening on. But uh, the chairman called me and said he had a very urgent uh, matter to discuss with me. And so we, we began our discussion. He basically said that the president has now directed an immediate withdrawal of U.S. forces from Syria uh, at, at, right at that effective point. This represented a very sharp 180 degree policy change for the US led coalition. Frankly, it was quite a shock to me. We had a fight underway. Uh, there had been no apparent coordination with our coalition partners. We had coalition partners on the ground with us in Syria. There had been no heads up to our Syrian Democratic Force partners about this. Our force was 100% dependent upon our partners on the ground for force protection and movement security. Uh, and we had an extraordinarily uh, immature and fragile architecture to, uh, to support an immediate withdrawal. We were still using debt, dirt airstrips to move supplies and materials into, into Syria. And we had an extraordinarily dispersed force, so the ability to do anything quickly uh, was, was not possible. So after a quick discussion with the chairman, we agreed, that, we agreed on a few things. We agreed that I would notify General Maslum, the commander of the Syrian Democratic Forces, that I would engage our coalition partners and talk to them about what we were doing. We would begin deliberate planning on a, on a, on a withdrawal plan to support the president's uh, decision. We would keep information flowing uh, on the status of the fight, the risk of the force and mission and regional reactions. And we agreed that I would uh, contact General Maslum and explain this to him. And so as I hung up with the chairman, immediately got onto a video teleconference with General Maslum. Many of you have probably seen him on TV here recently. He's become a little bit of a, a little bit of celebrity there as we've over the last couple of weeks. Uh, he's a guy that I've visited every month for, for three years. And in between, we talked on video teleconferences. We had a very good relationship. So I got on a video teleconference. Frankly, it was one of the hardest things that I've ever done to tell a partner that we had depended on, whose forces had, uh, had absorbed about 11,000 casualties in support of our common objectives, uh, that we were going to pull out, and we was, this, this decision was immediate. Uh, I provided him that direct information. I told him what we knew and what we didn't know. I told him that we would uh, move deliberately with this. Uh, we were not panicked. Uh, we would keep him fully integrated and make him part of the planning effort and that we would continue to communicate. Before I talk specifically about, so this was a fairly significant uh, emotional event for, for everybody here, and it was uh, professionally, I think, a very challenging uh, situation for me, given, uh, given our, our campaign plan to that particular point. But before I talk about how, I, how, we, how we dealt with this particular inflection point, I think it's important to talk a little bit about the campaign itself. This policy change was really just the latest in what had become an increasingly complex uh, campaign plan and environment. Uh, we were all very, very certain, I certainly was, that the commander in chief was concerned about endless wars. Uh, we are as well. But I had assessed at this point that we had solidified our approach through some common national objectives here. 
of defeating ISIS, of stabilizing the situation so that uh, our diplomats could, uh, could use our, our military uh, accomplishments as a strategic advantage in pursuing a political solution, and, and that's principle we were focused on. Additionally, our, our nation had said we were going to stay in this area so that it couldn't be exploited by the country of Iran. So I, I believed we had the political uh, backing to, and the policy backing to keep us in place for, for a while, certainly to complete the plan. Um, this campaign, from its inception to its current point, uh, exuded uncertainty, conflict, contradiction, competition, confusing policy, and, and deep underlying issues. And we learned a lot about operating in this environment. Every action led to a reaction, and oftentimes uh, those were unpredictable reactions. There were several factors that led to this, uh, to this campaign plan. It started with the emergence of the Islamic Caliphate. Uh, and, and again, there are a variety of factors that, that, that gave rise to this organization. A brutal crackdown by the Syrian regime leadership linked to the Arab Spring fed it. Corruption and disenfranchisement uh, by the government of Iraq had seeped into the Iraqi military and in many of the institutions and undermined uh, the moral authority that they had. A lesser contributing factor, in my view, was our decision to largely leave Iraq in 2011 without of a way of assuring that we could sustain the stability that we ultimately achieved in our, our military campaign from 2003 to 2011. ISIS was not a typical violent extremist organization, if there is anything like this. Uh, they were, in fact, an Islamic army uh, seeking to not only occupy, but in fact govern terrain in this area. Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi declared himself the caliph in his territorial possession as the new Islamic caliphate. And they supported this with an extraordinarily aggressive social media campaign uh, that literally drew tens of thousands of foreign fighters to the caliphate, uh, giving, a pen, giving an outlet to pen up men and women around the world, came from over a hundred different countries, uh, uh, who were suffering from lack of opportunity and hope and were disenfranchised in their own countries. There was poor border control and corruption along borders that helped facilitate and allow this movement to take place. And it led to a staggering refugee problem. 3.6 million Syrians moved from Syria into Turkey. 700,000 moved into the country of Jordan. And the, and the population of the country of Lebanon, about 1.5 million people on a day-to-day on a -day basis, was doubled with refugees that streamed into that country. And there were significantly internally displaced people, people that couldn't leave uh, Syria but also couldn't stay in their homes and communities. The international response was very slow and uncertain. Uh, there was a lack of political commitment, in many cases uh, outright avoidance. Uh, many were debating whether this was a local problem or whether it was an international problem. We debated whether the problem was Assad or whether the problem was ISIS. We talked about whether we should focus on Iraq or Syria or both. Uh, we debated whether this was a military, an intelligence, or a law enforcement response. And there were a variety of independent actors that were playing out here. There was extraordinary dysfunction in the Syrian opposition to, uh, to the Assad regime. We had extreme difficulty identifying who was in charge and what their motives were. Arab partners across the region were providing direct arms to different groups on the ground trying to pursue their, uh, their objectives. And there were many Western countries that were engaged in, in, uh, in their own irregular warfare approaches here. ISIS took advantage of this chaos. They moved quickly, they gained ground, they overran resources. At one point, they had nearly a billion dollars in U.S. cash that they had taken from a variety of, uh, of banks that they had overrun, particularly in the Mosul area. They orchestrated extremely brutal tactics as they pub that they publicized through a highly effective information campaign. Ultimately, our political leadership agreed to respond. And then we set about the work of building a coalition of the willing and developing a, 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 a campaign plan, all under the U.S. political and military leadership. 
this proved a challenge in and of itself, orchestrating of, uh, uh, and combining a number of different national caveats and objectives and capabilities. Some countries were willing to go to uh, Iraq, some were, willing to, were not willing to go to Syria. Some were willing to do both. Some were willing to provide money. Some were willing to just provide military capability. So it was a significant challenge just building that. Ultimately, uh, we were able to form a coalition here uh, and develop a, develop a plan, as you kind of see there, military operations, uh, stabilization, and then normalization of the situation. But we had some basic guiding principles that were put in place by our political leaders. We would orchestrate a, a campaign that was by, with, and through our partners. They would do the fighting on the ground. We would support them, and there would be an arrangement, a legal uh, and uh, authorities arrangement that would allow us to do the things that we would do. Our, our campaign would be focused strictly on ISIS, not on the Assad regime. On the ground in Iraq, we would support the Iraqi uh, Iraqi forces, and we would, we would commit forces to that particular area. We would not initially put people on the ground in Syria, and we would pursue an, an Arab proxy force. Uh, there was an extraordinarily low tolerance for risk. If we had had a setback early on, I'm very convinced that uh, that would have changed the course of the campaign plan in a significant, uh, significant way. Once this was done, then we had to move about finding partners. And this proved to be a challenging and complex process as well. Uh, the Iraqi army and the Iraqi military had largely been routed by ISIS in the early days of the campaign. There was extraordinarily low morale, and what equipment that they had, uh, the large amount of equipment that they had, had a, a large amount of it had been actually abandoned and turned over to ISIS, left for ISIS to use. This, this, this proved a significant problem. Uh, the Iraqi army was, uh, was plagued with poor leadership, a lack of a coherent command and control structure, uh, corruption in their institutions. It's amazing to me that how in the course of just a couple years, corruption can, uh, can seep into these institutions that we invested so much into. There was poor maintenance, poor sustainment, uh, and virtually no training systems in place. The Iraqi army was largely unrepresentative of the people. It was mostly Shia, with li little Sunni or Kurd representation at this point, mostly due to the policies of the, of the prime minister at that time, um, who was ultimately replaced. There were multiple security entities, Ministry of Defense, Ministry of Interior, the, uh, the Counterterrorism Service, the Popular Mobilization Forces, the Peshmerga, and uh, these were all separate organizations with no unifying uh, ability between all of that. Along the way, the Grand Ayatollah uh, Sistani uh, reached out to the people and, and emphasized the importance of them helping with the country, and this helped. It brought militias uh, to help, but it also brought militias uh, that were beholden to Iran, adding another element of complexity to this. Um, our effort to find turning to Syria, our effort to find uh, and develop an Arab proxy force in Syria failed. Uh, we are unable to find sufficient numbers of Arab fighters who were willing to focus on our priority, defeating ISIS. And even those that we could identify and train and uh, organized into units. Uh, we had extraordinary coordination issues with Turkey, other partners in the region, and with uncertainty in our own policy channels uh, that really subverted their effective employment. Uh, and as a result, we got extraordinarily uh, high scrutiny from Congress because we had spent so much money on this. It was not a good, not a good period right here. Ultimately, we found our Syrian partners in the rubble of a place called Kobani with the, with the Syrian Kurds, who were literally with their backs against the border fighting uh, ISIS. Uh, we made the decision to support them with that. We knew immediately that there would be issues and concerns with Turkey. Our national security process kicked in, and, uh, and this was debated in a significant way. Ultimately, we made the decision to adopt the YPG, the, the Syrian Kurds, uh, as our partners, and ultimately grew that into a force we referred to as the Syrian Democratic Forces, to which we took the Kurds and we added Arab militias into a very effective uh, fighting force. Uh, and then we set about trying to identify effective partners. And you see uh, both of these, uh, General 
um, Muslim Kobani, uh, the leader of the Syrian Democratic Forces, and in, and in Iraq, we were able to identify a three-star officer who essentially functioned as their joint task force commander, Lieutenant General Abdul Amir. Uh, and he helped to bridge uh, these, these, these complex uh, security institutions there and did it very effectively, both of them throughout the entire campaign. Uh, now with our partners and with a plan, we got about executing the fight. Uh, it started with fits and starts. It was a difficult, it was a difficult fight. I remember when we went to Fallujah, uh, we still were struggling with uh, command and control uh, within the Iraqi forces and we had different entities of their security forces doing different things and as a result uh, it uh, it exacerbated the human problems we created a significant uh, refugee problem out of that town and there were and there were reports of atrocities by some of the elements of the Iraqi security forces so this was something we had to address um, the lack of coordination and command and control was was a challenge throughout all of this uh, of course, we had to also balance our partner interests with our interests. The Iraqis wanted to go in a particular direction. We wanted to go in different places with our campaign plan, and we had to work through that. The Kurds had the same thing. They were very keen to, to focus on, uh, on Kurdish areas, but we knew we had to focus in other areas uh, to address the ISIS threat, and so we had to work through this. And there was also the presence of external actors, Turkey, Russia, Iran, Israel, all at different parts of the, uh, of the fight interjected themselves in, in big ways and small ways into the campaign uh, that made this extraordinarily difficult. Uh, we had a very good political partner uh, uh, that helped us, Mr. Brett McGurk, the President's Special Envoy here, helped, helped manage a variety of those things uh, and helped us work through that. Um, the fight here was almost exclusively major urban combat. The fight for Mosul in a city of 1.8 million people was the largest sustained urban fight that our army had participated in uh, since World War II. Uh, it is a fight that, that drug on for nearly nine months. Raqqa was not much shorter than that. Uh, the nature of ISIS fighters meant that they fought to, fought to the end. Uh, there was no surrender. There was no opportunity to do that. They were going to fight until they were end. And of course, adding to the complexity of this, uh, uh, through, a, through the campaign, we changed administrations, uh, and that added an element of uncertainty and, uh, and complexity into it as well. We did prevail, uh, ultimately, and liberated the caliphate. Uh, we immediately had some challenges with stabilizing areas. Uh, our government made the decision to withdraw funds that we were, at, uh, we had were counting on to help stabilize these areas, and it put more emphasis on trying to reach out to international partners to do this. There was a lack of access for UN agencies and uh, non-government organizations to get into these areas. Uh, the, the government of Syria didn't support that, and the UN will not go uh, into these areas if there isn't support from the sovereign government. Uh, there was significant destruction of dwellings and, uh, and infrastructure. There was massive human displacement that had taken place. Uh, and so we had to set about trying to address these immediate uh, concerns and reestablishing governance. Uh, we detained a large number, we didn't, our partners did, a large number of, uh, of Iraqi or of uh, ISIS fighters, foreign and otherwise, uh, and family members. And they had to be uh, secured and they had to be protected. Uh, and this grew into a significant problem because many countries where these fighters came from, they didn't want their fighters back and they didn't want their, certainly didn't want their family members back. Uh, and this, this grew to be a, a very significant uh, problem. Uh, there was slowness and, in some cases, an absence of an effective process to get us to an ultimate political solution, and so this caused it to drag on. Of course, we've all seen this play out over the last uh, couple of weeks. So the question that I would just pose for you at this point is, how did we overcome this? How did we work through the disruption? And so I'd just like to spend a few minutes talking with you a little bit about that. I think there were six things that we tried to focus on. And this kind of goes back to my point to you here, is that there was no secret sauce, there was no magic formula here. This was about mastery of things that we all know uh, and, and really paying attention to this throughout the campaign. First and foremost, it was, uh, it was important to have a unifying or organizational culture. I'm here to tell you, I know here at, at uh, VMI, 
you spend a lot of time talking about values and, and the importance of that. I'm here to tell you that, that played a pretty big issue here. Understanding the values of our partners out there and imposing our own values on people, our own ideology, our own beliefs, uh, the fact that we valued human life uh, and that we were not going to exacerbate human uh, suffering as much as we could was an important aspect of our campaign plan. So organizational culture, how you think about things, how you approach things, really guided our efforts throughout this campaign. And we were successful, I think, in helping our partners understand that and adopt a, a similar approach. So organizational culture was an important aspect of this. I love this quote, and I know I'm, I'm here in, uh, uh, in, in, in Virginia and, uh, you know, a place of the Confederacy, so I apologize for using a union quote here, but I, but I love this quote because it speaks about the idea of trust, uh, the idea that if you're in a difficult situation, we are going to come and help you. Uh, and that was an important aspect of this. Uh, with our partners on the ground in, in Iraq and Syria, and certainly with all of our coalition partners, we had to have what I described as pervasive trust. The idea that when you get in a difficult position, we are going to be there with you uh, to help, through the, help you through that. And this sustained us uh, throughout setbacks, uh, throughout political uh, left and right turns that we saw throughout the campaign. Uh, and through both administrations, uh, frankly, uh, that helped us uh, kind of keep this moving forward. The idea of trust is extraordinarily important. And this was, this was built personally, uh, and it was built organizationally, and it extended up and down the chain of command, certainly in, in our instance, uh, throughout our partners' chain of command. So pervasive trust was an important aspect of this. Flat communications and building relationships. We had to figure out a way to talk about what we were doing and communicate, not just to our partners and people in the region, but we had to talk to the American public and make sure they understood what we were doing here and why we were doing it uh, in the manner that we, uh, that we were. So flat communications uh, and, uh, and making sure that we had all of that in place was extraordinarily important building strong relationships. It wasn't enough for just me to have a relationship with my partner, but those relationships had to extend down through the chain of command. Uh, relationships were extraordinarily important. We had to learn to make decisions at the right level, to enable decision-making at the right level and, and risk acceptance at the, at the right level as well. Uh, this young man right here uh, uh, it was, a, was an Air Force F-16 pilot. Uh, and I had lunch with him one day after he had returned from Syria. Uh, and he really emphasized this point to me uh, because what he, what he wanted to talk about during our lunch was he wanted to talk about uh, his experience flying over our troops in Syria and making sure that I understood how he was looking at the situation and, and how he would apply his firepower in support of, of our troops if he had to. Uh, and he wanted to make sure that that represented my, that was in accordance with my intent. And I thought that was a very mature thing for this young captain, just a few years out of, out of an institution like this with his, uh, with his commission here, understanding that. And it, and it really highlighted to me the, a really important aspect of our, of our campaign uh, and how we work through this. And that was allowing decision making to be right at the right level while holding risk at the right level. And in many, in many regards, I was the person, or my commanders uh, at, the, at the general officer, flag officer level were holding the risk, but, the key to, but we were doing that in order to allow our subordinates at a lower level uh, to make decisions. So I think there's an inverse relationship between where you hold risk and where you allow decisions to make. And I think that we figured out a way to, to find that balance. And that helped us work through complexity. It allowed our subordinates on the ground to actually make the decisions they needed to make, knowing that they would be backed up by the chain of command and that we would absorb the risk for the things that, uh, uh, things that happened. Some of you will remember an incident that occurred in February of, of 2018. We had a, a Russian element that came and tried to come across the river in the western part of, uh, or the eastern part of Syria and go to the oil fields. Uh, we had a young special forces major on the ground who saw all the indications of this. Uh, and he understood what was, what was happening. He was able to communicate that effectively. Uh, and then to make decisions uh, operating under the, under the kind of the risk umbrella that we, uh, that, we, uh, that we applied for him. 
and he was very effective in terms of, of doing that. I think the last thing I would highlight to you is that what we did effectively throughout this very complex period was, was tie together feedback loops. Those of you that have read Secretary Mattis's uh, recent book here uh, have probably heard about this idea of feedback loops. I was a commander for him when I was a JTF commander and I learned about it from him. The idea here is that what we're trying to do up and down the chain of command is, is establish shared awareness, shared alignment, shared action by moving information up and down and making sure people understand. That last example that I just cited to you about this young Special Forces major, when he saw the indications that something was up, he immediately started communicating that up and down the chain of command, all the way to got to me, and I went to the chairman and the secretary. And ultimately, the, uh, the chairman called uh, General Gerasimov, the Russian chief of defense, to confront them on this. Uh, and of course, they, they feigned knowledge of this, and then when they came across, uh, this young major brought all the ISR, all the firepower he could to bear, uh, and we ended up uh, destroying that column, killing, by our estimate, 200 Russians on the ground and not turning it into an international incident. That's the power of feedback loops and keeping people aligned, aware, and then acting in, in accordance with this. These were the things that we did, these six things that really helped us work through this complex environment. So let me take you back to where my story began here, back on the on the 19th of December, uh, in this very, very challenging period for me of trying to work through this. Uh, so how we dealt with this was, was by applying those six things that I've just talked talk to you about, about making sure we emphasized our values. We had a partner on the ground, they were relying on us, they were trusting in us, and so our approach at this particular point had to, had to reflect that. We had to be able to communicate effectively. We had to make sure that the leadership understood the situation on the ground. Uh, the president has a lot to deal with. Uh, he's the president of the, of, of the United States and he's the leader of the free world. Uh, so he doesn't always have the, uh, the, the, the details of what's happening on the ground. So it was extraordinarily important for us to communicate that, hey, you just can't pick up and leave from a place like Northeast Syria. It takes some time. And ultimately, our communication was successful, and we developed a, camp, a plan to do this that actually had us increasing our presence on the ground before we actually decreased. And in other words, getting bigger to get smaller. Uh, and we were able to communicate that effectively to him and, and to our other leaders and, and get a good plan in place to do that. We certainly relied on great relationships with our partners. Uh, many, of our, many of our coalition partners felt like they'd been backdoored a little bit. Uh, and so we had to rely on relationships to, to maintain that. And we had to trust our people to make decisions at the lower level and that we were going to cover them uh, with, our, with our risk acceptance. And we had to employ these feedback loops throughout. This was absolutely critical to you. So there is no, there is no, magic, no magic tool that we pulled out. This was pretty basic leadership approaches right here, but it was a mastery of these leadership approaches that, that I think allowed us to work through this campaign and then when we were confronted with this very difficult situation in December, to really find a, a solution that, uh, that, would, uh, that, would, that would help us work through that. So, where does that bring us today? Well, I'm here to tell you that complexity reigns out there. As we've seen over the last couple of weeks, we've seen, again, continued policy decisions by our leaders, uh, uh, certainly all within their constitutional requirements that have imposed more challenges onto those who are charged with, uh, with orchestrating these things. And so my, my point to you here is that uh, even, even with devising great ways of moving forward and, and trying to work through complexity, complexity will always be an aspect of what we are dealing with, certainly in the national security realms, and something that we will have to, have to particularly deal with. And uh, certainly that's, that's the case where we are right now as we continue to work through this situation, even with the success we saw over the weekend of getting Mr. al-Baghdadi a, a key milestone, certainly, we still will have to continue to, uh, to deal with, the, uh, with these continued aspects of complexity. So, hopefully I've shared a little bit of an idea, uh, some ideas with you about, about the environment that we're stepping into out there, that you will be stepping into out there, and some ideas about how we work through that. So, what I'd like to do, I, I'd like to stop at this point, and I'd be very happy to take any questions that anybody has. Thank you.
Hello, sir. Uh, I had a question. You mentioned the implied trust that the U.S. needs between us and our allies. With this new development in Turkey moving into Kurdish areas and us kind of losing face on that, do you believe that the U.S. has lost some of that implied trust? And if so, how do we go about gaining it back in the future? Well, you know, I, I think strategically, I think we have uh, caused uh, some of our partners out there to wonder how committed we are to some of these things here. Um, and, and I think that's, uh, that's a concern. And I've kind of expressed that um, that concern in some of my writing. So I, I do think there is a cost that comes with this. Uh, that said, you know, uh, uh, again, as you kind of work the feedback loops, as you kind of see the, uh, the president, uh, as he's kind of dealt with this and the leadership at all levels, we have been able to maintain contact with them. And, you know, as we, as we learned, the, the Kurds were absolutely essential to the successful operation we had overnight. So I think what you have to do is, you know, you're, we're going to deal with these aspects of it, uh, but, uh, at a, but at lower levels, you can continue to stay engaged. You can continue to talk with our partners. You can continue through your own actions to, uh, to demonstrate that, but uh, that we're good partners. And, uh, and I think, uh, you know, people are smart enough to figure out, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, policies and interests sometimes change and that we have to deal with that. Uh, so I, th I think it makes it a little bit harder long term, but I think the key piece will be for, uh, for us to, uh, you know, continue to, to not let that be an impediment to us, to trying to partner with people, to move forward with them, to put our trust in them, and, and to be trustful partners at the levels that we operate. It's interesting to me, uh, I, I sent a note to General Mazloom over the weekend. Uh, I still maintain contact with him, and I congratulated him on their support to uh, uh, to our, our operation against al-Baghdadi, and his response was a very short uh, but insightful one. He said, thank you, this was our responsibility. So even despite everything, they still see value in this relationship, and we have to, we have to build on that, and you have to continue to move forward on it. So thanks, thanks for your question. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Good morning, sir. What lessons do you think the United States has learned that we can take forward to prevent another incident like this happening in places like Nigeria or Somalia or Mozambique where there's developing insurgencies? Well, you know, certainly, um, you know, certainly from a, from a security standpoint, we have to, we, if we're going to make the decision to, uh, to become involved in these things, we need to do it as early as, as possible. Uh, things don't get better over time. This is, I tried to lay out for you, and as I talked about this campaign plan, things progressively got worse the more we delayed our, our entry into this. So that's, that's I think, uh, uh, you know, an important aspect of it. But more importantly, what we have to do is we have to reach out to these countries where we see these problems, and we have to engage them early, and we have to get them to address the underlying issues uh, that are giving a rise to these types of uh, these types of, uh, uh, you know, reactions with, uh, of extremist groups. You know, in, in, in my, my point in Iraq is that we had a very good relationship. When we left in 2011, we had a very good relationship with the government of Iraq. And we didn't need to leave thousands of people on the ground. We just need to leave enough uh, so that we could continue to be influential. We could continue to remind them. We could continue to keep our eye on corruption and help them work through that. Um, so that they didn't, uh, they didn't devolve to the area that they did. It's, it's instructive to me that the one element that we did stay with in Iraq was the counterterrorism service. And it was just two ODAs, 24 operators on the ground, stayed in place. And yet that force really became the hub around which the rest of the Iraqi security forces actually coalesced as we, as we did that. And I am absolutely convinced that our, keeping our operators with them kept them straight, kept them focused on, on what they were about, and helped prevent the, uh, the insipid uh, corruption, uh, uh, disenfranchisement, and other things we saw in other parts of the force that we had locked away from, it kept it from happening there. And so, you know, this, this requires an investment. If we have an interest in preventing this stability, then we have to invest something into it. Thanks, sir. Thanks. Uh, good morning, sir. Thank you for coming to speak with us. Um, is there one book that you've read you to be particularly insightful or impacting, especially to those of us who are aspiring second lieutenants? 
Yeah, um, first off, <laughs> I, think there's a lot, I think there's a lot of great books out there, and I've, I've read, uh, I'm a pretty eclectic uh, uh, reader, frankly, and, and read a lot of different things. My, my personal, you know, for young officers, I think, uh, or cadets that are getting ready to do this, I think one of the best books that you can read is Once an Eagle. That really addresses our profession and talks about uh, the, op the choices that you can make. You know, uh, when you go through that and you see the characters and you see the different decisions they make in terms of the leadership path that they go down, I think it helps you understand what the profession is about. I mean, uh, I think uh, we want, we certainly want more Sam Damons out of this than we want Courtney Massengales. Uh, but you see that, uh, you know, in our profession, we sometimes have both of those things. And I think this is a really good book for young officers. It's a long book, I get it. Um, and uh, you know, take it in bites, but I think it's a good book to help you think through the profession that uh, that many of you many of you aspire to. Thank you, sir. Good morning, sir. Uh, you spoke about your idea of overlapping feedback loops at the strategic or operational level of warfare. Could you also speak about how that might apply at the tactical level, which we'll be entering into as second lieutenants? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it. I think it. Uh, I, I think it applies all the way up and down the chain of command. And what you have to do is you have to encourage people uh, to talk and to disagree on uh, professionally on on the things that we're doing. And uh, I think as a commander, I think you uh, you you can set the environment for doing that. One of the things I always did when we went to, you know, and I'm, I'm not trying to highlight myself as you know being the epitome of all this. I certainly have my challenges as well as we work through this. But one of the things we tried to do routinely when we went to Iraq, when we went to Syria, was make sure that we sat down with, uh, with a variety of leaders at multiple different levels, and among us, all, everybody had a chance to talk. And in, in that case, most of my time was spent listening. And what I found that that did is it gave me different perspectives, but it also was a good way for people to share among themselves. And you could see where there were friction points, you could see where there were disagreements, uh, and conversely, you could see where there was alignment. And the idea that, that we were trying to, uh, to get out of that was getting everybody to kind of look at the situation the same way, not exactly the same way, but generally the same way, trying to, you know, uh, Think about how we were going to act in that environment and, and trying to keep people aligned with the direction we were going. So, you know, I think the role of leadership is not just trying to align senior leadership, but not just trying to align to our national leadership, but is making sure that you inculcate that all the way down the chain of command and you support people that, uh, that, uh, that have a different view. You know, uh, Secretary Mattis, I'm, I'm a big acolyte of his. I, I, I think he's a, a wonderful man, a great leader. He used to always encourage, uh, encourage, encourage leaders to embrace the mavericks in your organization, the people who think differently, the people who speak out, uh, who got different ideas and are not afraid to argue. You have to encourage that in your organizations. I think you can do that. Uh, and, and when leadership does that, you can do it. You can do it in a professional manner, and I think it, it adds a lot to the organization. You've got to allow people to have different, different viewpoints because that's where you really kind of uh, round out the, the approach that you ultimately end up taking. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, sir. Thank you for speaking today. Um, my question is about the, uh, current station of, the current state of where we are with the Kurds in Syria right now. So obviously it was a big controversial move that we pulled out and a lot of people thought, hey, we were working with the Kurds for a long time, we had a common enemy, what's going on? Um, but I think one thing people don't know about the Kurds, they've had their own stake in Syria for a long time and also not just in Syria, in Iraq and in Turkey, um, to create their own state basically. Um, something that really hasn't been mentioned about or talked about in regards to this whole situation. So in regards to this history of the Kurds, trying to form their own state, and now with us leaving them, it kind of looks a little weird, but um, now that we don't have this common enemy of ISIS anymore, what is there left for us to continue to support the Kurds in Syria? Well, you know, actually, and what's really interesting about it, and I think it speaks volumes about these Kurdish partners, particularly the ones in Syria, and I think everyone appreciates how good partners the Kurds have been, the Peshmerga has been in, in Iraq, uh, but they have continued to stay linked to us. So, uh, you know, they actually uh, have uh, resumed some counter-ISIS operations uh, between U.S. 
coalition forces and uh, and uh, and Kurds and in some other areas. They've continued to keep uh, control of the detention facilities where fighters are. They've continued to safeguard uh, the family members of ISIS. Uh, ISIS fighters in the, in the in the camps where they are, um, so we have con we have continued to uh, uh, continued to do that. I, you know, I, I would just highlight one thing for you. You know, you mentioned the statement. I, I will tell you, I was extraordinarily uh, direct and clear with General Maslum, as were our political leaders, that we it was not our political objective to create a a uh, a Kurdish statement in Syria. That was not. We were never going to support that. And we, from the very first time I met him, uh, we, we, we discussed that and we made that very, very clear. And frankly, he understood that and, and was supportive of it. He was very quick to remind me that yes, of course, we are, after all, Syrian citizens. What we would like is to be representatives. What we did emphasize to them is that uh, a benefit of being partnered with us is that as we got to a political process, which I would admit has been very difficult to get to, that the peoples of Northeast Syria, Kurds, Arabs, Christians, others that are up there, would be represented at, a, at an ultimate political uh, solution. And, uh, and I think that's about as, as much as we were willing to commit to uh, policy-wise. Um, I, you know, in, in some ways, in some, some odd ways, uh, the decisions of the last couple of weeks, which, you know, I certainly would not have recommended, but it, it, is the, it is where we are and we have to deal with the situation as it is, have, uh, I think, uh, brought the Kurdish problem, the challenge that they have, more to the forefront and uh, in a weird way may actually help in the long run uh, for them to, you know, to address this because there are certainly more people that have, uh, that have, you know, become aware of this and might be aware. I'm not saying that that was, this was a grand design, it was a good approach to do it, uh, but it is where we are and, and maybe that can, that can help. So, you know, I think we have to be clear with our partners from the beginning and we have to, uh, uh, you know, we have to make, we have to be very resolute in, in what we're willing to do and, and, and we should be careful about breaking any relationships. My personal view right now is the Kurds are, are not only do they have the regime and the Russians as partners, but they still have us as partners. And frankly, more partners is better for them right now. Um, you know, even if ours is a little bit diminished, uh, more partners is better for them in, in, my, in my estimation. Thanks for your question. Thank you. I think maybe Good, we have time for one more here. No, so we'll have to end on that note. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you. Hey, let me, uh, let me finish up with just one last thought for you here. I know we've talked about this, uh, in, this uh, situation I've been involved in, but I, but I do know I'm talking to a room full of future military business American leaders out there. So I want to close by just sharing with you what I tell all my leaders. Uh, and it's pretty simple, pretty simple guidance, but I think you might take something out of this. Um, and so let me just share four quick thoughts with you. First of all, I would encourage you to trust your instincts. You're here at, at VMI, you're getting a, an excellent education, you're exposed to a lot of great leadership, you're studying important topics right here, you're developing, you're accumulating knowledge and wisdom as you go through this. I'm here to tell you, your instincts matter. I'm a guy that operates on the little hairs on the back of my neck. It's, you know what's, what's, what's right, you know what's wrong. There's a difference between uh, you know, uh, a mistake and misconduct. Uh, and it's important for you to understand that and be able to differentiate that as you go through this, this process here. But I would encourage you to trust your instincts. I, I would be willing to bet you would not be sitting here today uh, in this very exclusive uh, institute here if you did not have good instincts. So trust your instincts. Secondly, use your position for good. Some of you will go on to be commissioned. You will be platoon leaders. You will be captains. You will be uh, company commanders. You'll be leaders at a, at, a, at, a, at a high level. Some of you will go into the business world and you'll be a, uh, chief executive officers. But you will be in positions where you can make things better for the people that you are working with. Don't lose sight of doing that. Don't lose sight of using your rank, your position, uh, your authorities for good, for those that are, that are working with you and their families. Don't lose sight of that. Take care of yourself and, and your family along the way. Um, you know, at the end, of, the end of all this, whether it's a military career or whether it's a business career, uh, it'll be down to you and your families. Uh, don't lose sight of that. 
Uh, don't lose sight of that. Uh, many of, the, of our young men and women out there, they're looking for an example. They're looking to how you balance your family life and your professional life. So think about that from the beginning. I'm not just talking about people that are married. I'm talking about everybody, about having a balance in your life and trying to illustrate that. I'm telling you, it's hard. And I've failed at this more times than I've succeeded. Uh, and, uh, but it is something that I, would, I, I continue to try, to try to do better at. Uh, and, uh, and I would encourage you to think about it. And then finally, be a happy leader. Now, whenever I say this to a group, people are going to go, what in the hell is he talking about? Here's what I'm talking about. Everybody who is in a leadership position, whether it's in a military or business, has the inherent responsibility of making service uh, to the nation, to the community, both a positive and rewarding one. And you do this by being a positive leader, by looking for ways to make it enjoyable, by looking for ways to make it rewarding, uh, by, uh, by enjoying the things that you are doing and, uh, and, and helping people see uh, the, the enjoyment in that. I'll close with this last story. The most uh, devastating thing that I ever had happen to me in this particular realm is I had an Army colonel come to me who had just come out of commanding an extraordinarily uh, high-speed organization here. We really thought this guy was, had big legs, would go on to be a general officer. And he came to me because I was the first general officer in his chain of command, and he, and he said to me, hey, I'm, I'm going to resign. I'm going to retire out of this. And it, uh, and, uh, and it was my job to kind of talk with him about that. And when I asked him why he was doing that, he basically said, well, I've watched you general officers um, wasn't me in particular, but certainly me as part of a collective group here. And I don't want to do what you, what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. I, you don't look like you're enjoying yourself. And it really caused me to think of what is it the behavior that we are modeling that has caused this officer for whom we've invested all this time and talent into to make a decision like that. So don't lose sight of this fact of positive leadership, of trying to make it a rewarding experience, of trying to show the benefit of the things that you're doing to those that are coming behind you. It's extraordinarily important. Thank you very much for your attention. I've really enjoyed being here, and I wish you all the best of luck. Sir, thank you for your uh, thoughtful and timely remarks. And on behalf of General P, uh, our distinguished guests in the VMI Corps of Cadets, uh, please accept this gift as a token of our appreciation. Thank you, Nicholas. Thank Appreciate you, sir. It. It Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you for attending today. These proceedings are adjourned.